Hey everyone, I'm Coral. Welcome back to my channel. I'm here today with all the books that I managed to read in September. This month I did take part in the Magical Readathon, so the majority of what I read, I read for that. So a little more like fantasy than normal, a little less horror than normal, which is okay because I didn't want to go too hard into the horror stuff in September and then feel burnt out on it in October. Let's see, where do I start? In total, I ended up reading nine books this month. Two of them are horror books, three of them were fantasy. I read one nonfiction book, a true crime book, a science fiction book, and a thriller. I ended up reading 2,942 pages this month, which is about 98 pages per day. I have finally completed my page goal. I wanted to read 35,000 pages this year and I've completed that goal. I've read over 35,000 pages so far. I'm proud of myself. And so I've read about 2,400 pages over my goal at this point. I also had a goal that I set at the beginning of the year to try to read books that I owned previous to 2021. And I did read four books that I owned previous to this year. There were two others that I've owned before, but they were both rereads. So I didn't feel like I should count that because like I've already read them. So six books that I read, I already owned, but I'm gonna say four of them were off of my TBR for this year. So as far as the years these books were published, the oldest book I read this month came out in 1983. Then I had a book published in 1988. Then we jump all the way to 2013, 2014. I have three books I read that were published in 2020 and then two new releases, so 2021. On average, the rating I gave these books um, is 3.1, which is not great. However, there were a couple books that I really enjoyed this month, so it wasn't all terrible. Eight of the books I ended up reading were novels, one was a novella, seven of them were physical copies, one I listened to on audio, and one was an ebook. Um, it was an ARC, and I will get into that. Six of them are considered adult books and one, is, or sorry, not one, three of them were YA, which is like way more than I typically read in a month. I didn't end up getting to the book that I was going to read for the Buzzwordathon. The word was dark. I tried to read Dark Companions by Ramsey Campbell and I barely made it through the first story. And I think maybe that might be one I come back to. It's the first time I've read Ramsey, Ramsey Campbell and I don't know if, I don't know, I think it might be a little too stiff for me. And then I had a five star prediction this month, which was The Shoemaker by Flora Retta Schreiber. This is a true crime novel. This was a five star prediction and unfortunately it did not quite make it. This is a, um, account of Joseph Callinger's crimes. He was a, is he a serial murderer? I feel like, I don't think he is. I think he, oh no, technically he is because he killed exactly three people. I'm pretty sure. But he also committed a lot of really strange break-ins. Um, he was a person who suffered with schizophrenia he had some really delusional thinking and it got him into a lot of trouble. And it's really sad because, you know, typically I feel a lot of sympathy towards people, you know, because they, they just can't, they can't help that. However, you still have to be responsible for it. Um, and Joseph Callinger wasn't, he had many opportunities to uh, take medication to see a therapist, but he was too worried about um, seeming crazy and he just didn't do that. Instead, he became actually seriously mentally ill and hurt a lot of people in the process. So I think the biggest qualm I had with this, it's just, um, this is basically only told 
by Joseph Callinger himself. And Joseph Callinger isn't the only person who committed these crimes. He worked with his young, like 12, 13, 14 year old son, Michael, and you never get Michael's take on what happened. So it's really hard to, especially for somebody who must have been unreliable at that point, it's hard to, you know, know if that's really what happened. Um, so I don't know. And Flora seems to really just take what he says as, you know, set in stone. There were a few other people that she mentioned interviewing. However, it was not, I mean, it was like a couple sentences. It was like, you know, Joseph's wife and she said this and this and it's like, okay, she didn't have anything else to say about any of this. But, um, I don't know. It was entertaining. I don't know how accurate, like I said, this account is because of who it's coming from. I don't know how reliable it is. Um, however, you just feel, you feel really bad. He had a really terrible childhood and he grew up and made his children have a really terrible childhood. And yeah, I don't know. I'm glad that I read it, but I don't think it's like a super exciting, great. All right, then I have two books here that I'm not going to get into too much because they're going to be included in a trope video for next month. The first one is The Haunting of Alma Fielding by Kate Summerscale. I went into this expecting more of an account of somebody investigating Alma's haunting and it ended up being more like, it ended up being more like almost a biography on a, the man who worked with her, what was his name? Nandor Fodor, uh, he was like in, uh, he was from Hungary. He, this was like when spiritualism was really big. And so it really takes on more of that, like having seances and seeing if Alma can do any weird tricks and stuff like that. Um, not exactly what I was expecting because I was reading it and expecting a book more like The Haunted by Robert Curran. This is the third time I've read this, and I think every time I read it, it gets more and more terrible. I don't know. I will get into this more. This will be the spacey, spicy take when I actually, I think that whole video is gonna be real spicy because I didn't like any of the books I read for this, basically. Um, so yeah, that's the other one I will be talking about more next month. The other reread I did this month was Annihilation by Jeff Vandermeer. This one I listened to on audio. And the first time I read this, I didn't really like it, but I have the whole series and I'm wondering if I should keep them or if I should not. So I decided it's been quite a few years since I read this and you know, maybe the audio will help me like it more because I didn't really like it the first time I read it. And I will say it was, less difficult to get through because I was listening to it on audio. However, I feel basically the same about it. This is, if you didn't know, this is a pretty popular, I don't know, sci-fi horror thing. This is about this strange thing that happens in the, un the Southern United States where the ecology and the biology is just like really strange all of a sudden and there are very strange plants time goes by kind of differently. There's strange animals. Everything's just very different. And it's like, I don't know. I don't know exactly how to explain like physically what it's like, but they've been sending, the government has been sending these expeditions in to what they call Area X to explore it. And our narrator is on the 12th, I believe, expedition. Uh, I don't know, does it matter? Probably not. It's just very dry and clinical. I don't feel anything for any of the characters. Um, and I get like, they're scientists, so they can be very clinical. It makes sense, like it checks out, but I still don't like it. So I don't know. I've heard some people say that the second book is much different, but I've also heard people say, if you don't like the first one, you definitely won't like the second one. So maybe I'll just check the second one out on audio, listen to it. I mean, they aren't long, so I don't know. It's, it's an okay book, like it's entertaining. I just still didn't love it. Next though, I read The Cormorant by Chuck Wendig. This is 
the third book in his Miriam Black series. And this follows obviously Miriam who has the ability to see someone's death if she touches them. And of course that comes with a lot of consequences for Miriam. She doesn't want to see these things, it's terrible. In this story, she is, it's like some somebody is communicating to her from the future and she's seeing these deaths and the person she's trying to find knows that she's seeing these deaths and so like they're causing these deaths in a way where she will see it and know that it's him and it's like this weird mystery. Um, it was really interesting. I don't know if I like this quite as much as the second one, but it was still like a solid, I really liked this, I would recommend this type of a book. I really, Miriam is just such a funny character. Um, she's so witty and sarcastic. She has a hard exterior, but inside she's chewy like a milk dud. This is the best book I read this month. This is Six Crimson Cranes by Elizabeth Lim. And I believe that this is based off of a myth or a fairy tale kind of a thing. However, I'm not familiar with it, so I shouldn't even say anything about it probably. But this is about a young woman named Shiori. She is the princess of her kingdom and she is entering an arranged marriage that she wants nothing to do with. But that's just one tiny little plot point. In this story, it is a really big, expansive, fun fantasy story. It's a little bit whimsical. It's got a lot of like adventure and interesting settings. There is some fun magic in this uh, because Shiori is able to use magic and that's something that she should not be able to do. That's something that the kingdom has fought or the, not the kingdom, but the kingdoms in this land have fought together to like keep that contained in a place that's like not here only demons use that. People shouldn't be using that. Um, however, Shiori can, and it has to remain a big secret. However, uh, her stepmother finds out about it, and her stepmother basically banishes her from the kingdom, and nobody knows about it. And she cannot tell anybody, because the stepmother has also turned her six brothers into cranes and if Shiori tells anybody about anything, if she even speaks, her brothers will die. So it's like, you know, she has to try to get back to her kingdom and stop her stepmother without being able to write or speak or do, you know, any sort of communication. And it's just really fun and I wasn't, I wasn't expecting to love this as much as I did, but the writing was really nice, the characters were great, the magic was so much fun, and there's a dragon. So, like, what can go wrong? This is definitely something I'd recommend for um, people who like young adult fantasy. It does, it is a young adult fantasy book. It has, you know, kind of like a romance plot and, you know, it's not like the center of it, but it becomes very important to the plot line. Another YA fantasy I read this month, this is A Deadly Education by Naomi Novik. The setting of this was so cool, but it really overshadowed the plot. Um, this follows, it's like a name from Lord of the Rings, but what is it? I think it's Galadriel. I think that's her name. So I think it's Galadriel. Oh my God, I'm gonna feel so dumb if it's not and I'm saying it is this whole time. Yes, it's Galadriel. Okay, so her <laughs> this main character's name is Galadriel. Um, everyone calls her Elle. And she's kind of a weirdo in this school. But it's not really your typical school setting. It's like a magical school. You know, the people in it are mages. But it's like, there are no teachers. The school itself teaches. And there are all these terrible monsters in this school and it's like kind of how the school is able to function like at the end of your senior year you get put into this dungeon with all these monsters and if you make it out you've graduated and you know you should know you should know everything you need to know in order to live in you know the world because there are these monsters that seek magic and you know want to eat magic users 
So basically it's like a weird survival horror story inside this fantasy book because all the students are trying not to be killed. Galadriel isn't very good at school uh, because her affinity, the magic she has an affinity for is like destructive and she really does not want to become somebody who uses destruction. She just doesn't want to become somebody who uses destruction to power her spells. And so it's really hard for her because she has to figure out how to do things kind of the hard way. And she's not very good at other types of magic. So yeah, I mean, that's really what this is about. The plot is just kind of wobbly in my opinion, like, I can't even really tell you what it's about. It's not really, I don't know. It's not really a very interesting conflict or anything. They just, I don't know. There's monsters eating them and they're trying not to get eaten. But the school is so interesting and I really loved, you know, the setting. And nothing to write home about. I won't tell my mom about this book, <laughs> but it was all right. Okay, and since I almost forgot about it, I have to make sure to tell you about Nothing But Black and Teeth by Cassandra Caha. This comes out next month. This is a book I got as an arc from NetGalley, so that's how I read it. This I was very excited for, and it ended up being very disappointing for me. It's a novella, so it's pretty short and sweet, but I still found myself kind of dreading getting back into it, not being able to stay very focused on it, which is a shame because at first I was very drawn in. It has these really complicated characters. The setting is really cool. They're in this like ancient mansion in Japan. I'm not really sure, you know, everyone's kind of like, well, I don't know how we managed to do this, but here we are. And they're there because they're friends with a couple who is doing like a very private tiny ceremony at this haunted place because apparently the the wife is very interested in haunted houses and it's been her dream since she was a little girl to get married in a haunted house uh but in this mansion there is this myth of this bride who was buried alive and after that happened supposedly many brides were buried alive um in this same land on this same land uh, but as they find out, it might not be just a legend, it might not just be a myth. And what I what drew me in was that, like I said, the characters have very complicated relationships with each other. There are five characters in total, and they all seem to have beef with each other. Um, and they've all seemed to have been in relationships previously with each other, or like maybe not only previously. Uh, but you never really get the reason why everyone hates each other, um, aside from why the bride really hates the main character. The conflict was so interesting, but then it was like, well, we didn't get any answers about it, which is very disappointing. Um, I felt like the plot was very strange. It was like, all of a sudden these terrible things start happening and some characters are freaking out and some characters are like, well, I'm just gonna sit here and smoke a cigarette and it just doesn't, it didn't make sense. Um, it seemed like there was only high stakes for like one person involved and nobody else. And it, it was like, well, then why am I even here? The, the author uses a lot of really colorful language. Um, she has like very, what do they call it? Like purple prose. And I've listened to interviews with her and that's really, you know, kind of how she talks. So I understand that that's her, just her writing, but it did make it so I felt like I had to go back and reread large sections of this book like over and over because I just could not get the point of the sentence in my head. It was like, um, you know, a lot of the sentences were just there to be beautiful and not necessarily to mean anything. And sometimes I really like that. Um, I think Christy Demeester has a very similar type of writing where it's, um, you know, beautiful. Um, same with V Castro, but I just, it was like, it was hard to understand for me for some reason. Um, you know, this book kind of made me feel dumb and maybe I am dumb. <laughs> I don't know, but I don't know. All in all, the ending didn't make me feel anything. I didn't feel like the stakes were really high for any of the characters. It just was a novella that I ended up being a little bit disappointed in, unfortunately. 
And that's not to say that nobody else will like this book. I've seen plenty of really great reviews on it actually. So, you know, make your own decision. That's just what I thought about it. All right, last on my list is These Violent Delights by Chloe Gong. This is a book that I didn't really know much about before I picked it up. It came in an owl crate like last year. This is sort of a Romeo and Juliet retelling. Uh, this takes place in the 20s in Shanghai and it really follows two different crime families. Juliet is from the Psy family and she has kind of a romantic rival around her age whose name is Roma and he is from the Montego family who you know they're rivals. Um, Roma, Roma's family comes originally from Russia and Juliet's family has lived in China you know forever. So there is a lot of rivalry because the Chinese don't necessarily want the, the Russians um, imposing on their businesses. So there's like that underlying conflict, which is just really fun in and of itself. But then the author threw in this crazy, like sci-fi horror subplot where these people are being infected by something and they're dying and, you know, infection doesn't take a side. So both people um, who work with the Russians and people who work with the Chinese are dying. And of course, our Starcrest lovers have to work together to find out what's going on. I did feel like definitely some of these parts could have been um, edited down a little bit. There was some things where it's like, okay, I'm not sure why we're here, but it's fine, I guess. But the one thing that really did bother me was that I felt like this had a conclusion. This could have definitely just been done. But then the author's like, and then this, the end. And so like, it, there's a cliffhanger and now there's a second book and I wish it just would have been wrapped up in one. I think it would have been a great story wrapped up in one. Like it was concluded, why do we have a sequel? This is like probably my biggest beef with YA fantasy is that I just, don't always, I don't have time to read like one million fantasy books every year. And I don't know. Sometimes it doesn't bother me like um, Six Crimson Cranes. That has a sequel and that makes sense for what happened in the story. I don't really think it makes sense for what happened at the end of These Violent Delights. However, I don't know, make that money girl, I guess is all I can say. Um, I'm not obligated to read it, however, I feel like I have to since it's there. I don't know. I don't know. You know what? Maybe I will just pretend like this was a standalone and it got wrapped up and it's nice and it's fine. <laughs> Anyways, that is what I ended up reading in, in September. Thank you for watching, listening to me ramble and rants. I'd love to know if you ended up reading any of these and if you liked them, if you share any of my opinions or if you think I'm way off base. But anyway, thank you so much for watching. I will see you guys later. Goodbye.